welcome to Creative Blog. I'm your host, V. I interview people in creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We ask people on social media if they have specific topics they want us to discuss, as well as some drawing, drawing prompts. But unfortunately, this week, we forgot to do that because <laughs> sometimes things go crazy in the production side and we don't have all the pieces put together however we're so lucky to have our guest Loic Locatelli hi <laughs> of course it happened to me yeah <laughs> it happened to you yeah it's because you're the favorite so yeah of course you get yeah, special sure. treatment <laughs> I knew it I, you so you have like a super interesting journey because You've worked in animation, you've worked in comics, illustrator, you've worked and you're from France and you've moved all the way to Japan. So I guess I kind of want to ask you first, how did you decide to try out living in Japan? <laughs> wait, wait. This is the, okay, a long, uh, a long question. Okay. <laughs> a long question needs a long answer. How did it start? I think, I mean, if... Someone has read my comics, my com my previous comic books, like uh, Pocahontas and uh, Persephone. I think you can understand that the, the, the main topics of the two books is kind of how you can find your way in your own life. And if you don't feel at ease in the place you're living, you can try to find another space and create another um, way of life for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it when I designed these stories and when I uh, draw them, when I started these two comic books, I was in France, living in France, and I had no idea that I think inside this is what I wanted for myself as well. It was what my characters wanted. I mean, for Pocahontas is because uh, by uh, the big history, this is what happens to her and uh, this is the story I wanted to tell. And for Persephone, it's kind of the same. She's abducted. She has to go to um, the undergo uh, underworld and... She has to change her way of life. Mm -hmm. For both characters, it was not their choice. Mm -hmm. But uh, they had no choice but to change their way of life, the, the, their country and uh, their habits and stuff like this. And I never really realized that, but actually it was also the same for me. I was n I, I've never been really totally happy living in France, mm -hmm. if I can be honest. I mean, I don't know, maybe it happens for other people than mm -hmm. me. I mean, maybe to you as well. I mean... Yeah, you obviously I mean, changed your uh, <laughs> I've moved around. Your country of residence, yes, yeah. many times. So um, I was not happy in my life in France, honestly. I had my friends and stuff, but every time I was moving around and um, uh, having trips, I had I had long trips in the US because one of my best friends is living in North Carolina, and so mm. I visited him a few times. I've been in London a lot as well, and I was always thinking, damn, when I'm coming back to France, I'm unhappy, you know. Mm -hmm. I have never this feeling of like, oh, I want to go home, you know, home homesick. I never got right. that. So at some point I, I was living with my girlfriend at the time and she was uh, saying to me, okay, you know what? We are uh, less than 30. Mm -hmm. And when you're living in Europe and I guess it's also the case when you live in maybe Canada or a Asia, there is something mm -hmm. called the working holiday visa. Mm -hmm. I think if I'm not mistaken, you use this one as well to yeah, go to... I don't want to uh, maybe speak yeah. about your personal life. I don't know, but I think you, you 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 did that as well. So yeah, yeah, to go to Japan, I also used it to yes. spend a year in Japan because I was exactly the same. I was like, wow, I just you know, I'm still young. I want to like see the world and yeah. different countries and stuff. So that's what I did, and and it, I think it's a I think it's a really valuable experience. I think it's really really fun. Yeah. How old were you? If it's not indiscreet, when you mm, moved, I think I was twenty. Four. Yeah. Twenty four. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you were. What about you? How old were you when? I was twenty seven at the 27. time. Twenty mm -hmm. seven. You have until for people who don't know working holiday, uh, you have until your uh, your thirty to do it. Yep. After after that, maybe there is only Australia and Canada that accept until thirty two or thirty five. I don't remember. It's evolving every year, but mostly yeah. it works like this. So you get a visa, it's easy to get it, and you can go for one year in another country, country who are participating in this working holiday visa stuff, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I was watching Korean uh, movies and Japanese movies a lot at the time, and my girlfriend just 
was tired of me complaining about France and how unhappy <laughs> I was. So she told me, listen, what we can do is we, we, we do this working holiday visa stuff and you're watching uh, Korean movies and Japanese movies like crazy. So let's let's just go there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we I said, yes, or, or, why not? And, uh, <laughs> and so I wanted to apply for the Korean one. But at the time, it was in 2015. If you wanted to go to Korea, you had to, when you get the visa, mm -hmm. you have one month to move to Korea. Oh, or your visa will not be uh, it will not be valid anymore. So it was a bit more difficult. Mm. For Japan, you have one year, you know, so you have time to move away, move out from your flat, and uh, yeah. prepare a bit more. And mm -hmm. in Japan, I had many friends already over there, like mm -hmm. you, for example. I mean, yeah. you were coming back to France at the time, but you just spent one year over there and you knew people and yeah. so so I had someone to talk about and uh, to ask hey how was your experience and stuff so I remember I sent you an email and you gave me the the, the email address of uh, Christophe and uh, other people so yeah. I was not alone when I arrived in Japan so we decided to to move to Tokyo at, um, to was... Yokohama actually not Tokyo Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't spend a lot of time in Yokohama, but I, I liked it that it's like a seaside uh, city. Yes, 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 yes. That's so nice. I, Even as you... for now, it's my favorite city in, in Japan, so... Is that where you live right now? No, I'm living in Nagano now. Nagano, oh, nice. I have oh, lived nice. in maybe six months in Yokohama, uh, eight years in uh, Tokyo, and uh, I just moved to Nagano like a few months ago. Wow, how do you like it in Nagano? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not Tokyo for sure. It's less. Yeah, uh, it's like slow paced. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, let's be honest. I I'm a city boy, so for me, <laughs> Tokyo life is really the life. But uh, there is good points in Nagano as well. Uh, I cannot deny that the the price of the rent is like it cannot be compared. You know, you have two times the size of uh, the Tokyo apartments for twice uh, less uh, the amount of money that to is... pay for it and uh, so in Tokyo I, I I mean you know maybe but th there is a lot of l laws against pets you know you cannot get uh, dogs and cats and stuff it's really difficult to get pets in Tokyo mm. because the landlords they never want you to to have pets but in Nagano it's okay so we could have the dog and stuff like this so it's um, alright yeah that's it's more nice. enjoyable yes yes mm. there is aspects of Nagano that are better than uh, and Tokyo, it's not sure. super far from Tokyo you can no like, it's yeah one hour by uh, Shinkansen so the bullet train as uh, mm -hmm. we call it in, in the US or um, and three hours by bus so yeah mm, nice and so I'm guessing I'm trying to kind of veer into a little bit of like the financial life of an artist of a working artist because I'm yeah. sure that has kind of played into your decision to, to move, right? Like to be able, or, well, cause would you say your main work is comics or animation? When I moved to Japan, I never worked in animation before. So. Um, oh, interesting. I only did uh, comics. Uh -huh. And this is, this was one reason we could move actually, because you know, doing comics, you can do it remotely everywhere you want. So uh -huh. we didn't need, I didn't need to be physically in France or in Belgium to do that so right. and my my girlfriend as well was she still a comic book artist so mm -hmm. we could both do that so yes when we arrived it was not a problem we could just continue our job as comic book artists and not really think about anything else you know just have mm -hmm. fun in Japan and get the money uh, on the bank account and uh, that was it but uh, the things got more complicated when one year passed and so my visa expired. I mean, it mm -hmm. was about to expire. At this time, I was uh, I, I knew I didn't want to go back to France anymore. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to stay in Japan, I needed to find a job in mm -hmm. uh, somewhere, anything. You know, I mean, I could have been <laughs> a French teacher, uh, not... Uh, not an animator or anything, but uh, I needed something to get the proper working visa. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to meet... Uh, for one year, I met a lot of French working in animation industry in Japan. 
Yeah, there's a pretty big community yes, of yes, French yes, people yes. working in animation in yes. Japan. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> so I met, of course, the kind of uh, the the boss of French animation in Japan, Thomas Romain. And, yes. Uh, uh -huh. Of course, and uh, I also met maybe I think you know I think you know him I think he is your friend uh, Vincent Vincent. Nier. Yeah, I love him. I. I tried to get him on the pod, but it was really hard, like because of with the the time difference. Yeah, but um, I think I, I really think he would be happy to participate. I mean, yeah, I need to ask him again. I he's so funny. He's so crazy. Yes, I yes love he's him a so bit much. crazy. I think your uh, <laughs> uh, your editor will have a lot of work to do with Vincent on the podcast, but but uh, he, yeah, he's a funny guy. So uh, he's so funny. So we met and. Uh, we were good friends. We were we are still good friends, and so at the time, by pure luck, one of the guy working with them, with Tom and uh, Vincent, they were working in the same company called Satellite. Mm -hmm. And at the time, one of they had there were three or uh, four or uh, five. Sorry, <laughs> there were mm -hmm. five French guys uh, working in animation over there um, in what we called the French team. Mm -hmm. So they were the background artists for this company. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Long, was uh, going back to France to, because he was tired of living in Japan. Mm -hmm. So he told me, hey, do you want my spot? I just asked Thomas and uh, you can get an interview and maybe uh, if, wow. if you have the enough skill, you could get my job. So I asked Thomas and I got an interview, an interview and he, he said, yes, it's okay for me. I mean, you have... You are not skilled enough to do the proper backgrounds for animation right now, but we will form you. You know, this is the maybe the difference between Japan and the US mm -hmm. is that in France as well. I don't know about the US actually, but in France you need to have the uh, the skills before you enter the company. Mm -hmm. But in Japan you can get the skill in the company. You know, you know nothing in the beginning, and they teach you how to properly do your job and after six months when you're just doing like the side jobs and stuff you have enough skill to start to do your own uh, backgrounds and uh, and stuff like that, that is so interesting it's funny because so we had ken arto on the yes, podcast course, before and yes. he was so great and it's funny because i didn't really realize as we were talking how much that is such a huge difference between countries be between the cultures yes. Yeah, because it's true that it's not really in the Western culture to train yes. somebody on the job. Yes. Like we're trying to implement implement it, but it's it's not very easy to get that. Yeah. Like yeah, so that's really cool to yeah. hear and that. Basically, comics and animation are two completely different industries, and yeah. I had absolutely no idea how to do a proper background for. Uh, Animation. The Japanese animation. It's, yeah. it's it's not even like cartoonish or stuff. It's like usually quite realistic and stuff. So yeah. Uh, so it was nice. Uh, so so Thomas said okay, but we still need to have the big interview with the big boss of the company. So oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So I went over there with uh, my portfolio, you know, prepared and printed out and stuff because it's Japan. Wow. And, you like... know, you have it's paper paper country still. So. Uh, I, so I prepared funny. my stuff. Yes, I had my, uh, you know, a necktie. And I never wore a necktie before. I mean, uh, wow, and, it's uh, like it, a because real it's business. kind of formal. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's Japan. It has to be a bit formal. So, uh -huh. I arrived, and uh, Big Boss arrived at uh, as well. He he sat, and he looked at me a bit, and he, he asked me, uh, "Do you like living in Japan?" Yes. Do you like living? Where, where do you live? I say, "Oh, I live in Kitijoji." So Kitijoji mm -hmm. is. Not far at all from satellite. Satellite is in Asagaya. It's two stations apart. Mm -hmm. So he said, oh, it's not far. So you could come at the company easily and not be late. You know, this is very important for Japanese. So, oh, mm. it's okay. You live in Kichijoji. This is a good point. Still, <laughs> no interest for my portfolio at all. And then he said, the, so you, do you miss your, uh, your family in France? I said, no. I mean, I like my family, but uh, I'm okay if I don't see them often. So he said, oh, it's, it's a good point. <laughs> and then he said, um, "Do you have a girlfriend in Japan or in France?" He was not interested at all by the artistic stuff, just my own private life. That is so, so interesting. Yeah. And I said, I, "I don't have a girlfriend right now. I just broke up with my girlfriend, and I'm okay." And he said, "Oh, good, good." And then suddenly he said to me, "Hey, there is there is a lot of thieves in France, right?" 
Oh. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, I went in the south of France one time and uh, some guy uh, stole my wallet and he started to laugh. And uh, I, I look at Thomas and look, Thomas looks at me and uh, like, he was like, you know, I don't know. And um, so the big boss says, okay, you can wait outside. So I go outside. Two minutes pass, Thomas comes back and say, oh, he says it's okay, you can come and work for the company. He never, so he never crazy. looked at my portfolio. He has no idea of what I'm drawing or whatever. I mean, that is so I, funny. Yeah, wow. I was in the company <laughs> and I started to, <laughs> to learn how to do a proper background for a Japanese animation. And uh, who, I worked in satellite for two or three, three years in total. Did you? How well did you speak Japanese at the time uh, when you took at the interview? At the time, uh, I already spent one year in Japan, so I knew the basics and I knew how to communicate in a ca casual way. But it was mm. not enough yet to have like uh, meetings, for example, with uh, yeah, like professional <laughs> meetings and stuff. In the beginning, I didn't understand very well what they were asking me. Oh, right. There were one time I was with uh, with uh, Vincent and meetings in Japan it la it lasts for hours you know because they <gasps> they never decide for anything they are always like hmm, should we do this or that hmm, I don't know what do you think hmm, I don't know it takes four hours and it's hot you know because they put the air conditioner and stuff so it's very easy to to get tired and get a nap during the no! so yes. Oh so my god. <laughs> Vincent is always taking naps during meetings and you know he tries to only close one eye. So no! there is always one eye they can see open but it doesn't work. I think everyone can see he is, that is he is so sleeping. funny because yeah, that is so. such a Vincent thing to do. Oh my god. So he, he like... was sleeping and the guy asked us to draw it was we had to draw a market. It was a scene in a market. Mm -hmm. And the guy said you have to draw a, mark, uh, a shop about cheese. Mm -hmm. So I say, okay, a shop about cheese. Because uh, in Japanese, cheese, it says cheese. Cheese. So mm -hmm. I, I, uh, cheese. So I, uh, I say, okay, okay. So I note that on my notepad and we go back to uh, the office. I sat back at my desk and I start to draw this, uh, this uh, cheese shop. Mm-hmm. One week pass, I had other design to do, so I, I did them. And one week pass, we had another week meeting with the director, mm -hmm. and he, he looks at my uh, at my uh, cheese shop, <laughs> and he looks at it for a long time. You know, like of any other draw, drawing or background designs we do, he spend a, some time on it, and at some point, he's like, "This is great, but what is that?" <laughs> and I'm like, "But this is the, the cheese shop you asked." He said the cheese shop, and I mis I I mistook ch cheese, which is cheese, mm -hmm. and cheese, which is map, and ah! he wanted me to draw a map shop, a shop full of antique maps and stuff like this. So the character was supposed to find an old map and go to some other place thanks to this map. Oh my God. So it was a bit like, okay, I mean, sure, this is a nice cheese shop, but we we don't need that. So this is one of the mistake I could do in the beginning. After mm. that, it went okay, but yeah. That's so that funny. The example. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's so funny. Oh, wow. And who taught you to do backgrounds, like you said, like for anime, like in that very realistic kind of style? Uh, like... So Toma helped me the most, of course. Oh, um, nice. So I was... Uh, he taught me the, the basics of their own technique in this uh, studio so we were using a lot of uh, it will only speak to pros but um, we, we were only using smart objects so it's an option in photoshop where you can basically you make a new layer and you draw i can make an example i will make an example on the notepad oh, so for uh, yeah. people on the podcast you cannot uh, it will not work <laughs> for you but if you're, you're on youtube you will see so basically you draw on a new layer so you make a uh, kind of a squarish layer. Mm -hmm. And you can draw, for example, your street uh, in a flat way. So you draw houses uh, very flat, so there is no perspective mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. And then in Photoshop, you have a little option called Smart Objects, Convert to Smart Objects. So mm -hmm. this specific layer will now be a Smart Object, and you can 
put it in the perspective you want. So basically, for example, if mm -hmm. my perspective is like this, I can put my smart object like this and it will automatically redraw all my, I mean, oh, yeah. all my oh. houses in perspectives, in mm -hmm. perspective. And, but it would be not really interesting if it was just like this. You can always double click on this layer and always get back this flat one. So you can always make adjustments on the flat version and it will report it on the perspectived one. So you always have to only work in a flat way. And mm. just at the end of the process, you can add the 3D kind of uh, wow. stuff on the that... So it was really, mm -hmm. really useful. Mm -hmm. At the time, we didn't have yet uh, uh, other um, 3D uh, softwares like SketchUp and stuff like this. So we had to mm -hmm. use this. It was the most efficient way at the time. And but and now do you do you use SketchUp or like 3D? I'm, yes, I'm using. I I mean I'm not using it anymore for several reasons because I'm not doing this kind of realistic environments anymore. But at the end of this uh, yes this job yes I was I had to use uh, SketchUp. Thomas and other people in the company they are really really they are amazing with SketchUp. It's like when you when you look at SketchUp it it's like this raw software where you can only do cubes kind of and really mm -hmm. easy forms but stoma can make marvels with it it's it's incredible but me i don't i can only do the you know this assemble some uh, easy forms and then i will do a uh, 2d uh, lines on top of it so it mm. will, uh, but yeah, that uh, makes, it that simplified makes... the way we work a lot because in the beginning it was only on paper with a ruler and um, wait, I, you you had to I, do I that? You... I didn't, but Thomas had to oh. do that. And it's, wow, yeah, no, that's yeah, so I don't. crazy. Yeah, but it was uh, yeah at the end of the nineties. I think Thomas arrived in Japan in two thousand four. So at the time it was uh, you know Japan is very slow to upgrade to new technologies. So. I mean, that's... they are still using floppy disks, so... Uh, that's it's so crazy, <laughs> because they they have so much, like, they're so ahead on so many other technologies. E on other technologies, yes. But, uh, it's yeah. so crazy to me that I, I always get surprised by this, because even though I'm not, I'm not, like, entirely surprised, I'm like, yes, that makes sense, and I've heard that before. I'm also like, but they were kind of like the first one to come up with VR and stuff like that. So like... E yes, it's... You know, it's Japan. There is always two sides. On uh, <laughs> they are always you are always amazed of the thing they can invent, the new things they can invent, and how far back in the past they can be for so many other aspects of uh, like yeah, uh, I remember social like, life and uh, stuff. Like people, I still re do. You still have a floppy phone? Do you still have one of no, those? No, Garake. Like, we call them Garake. Yes, but uh, we don't yeah. have any more. Uh, you know, there is some kind of. Uh, technology uh, jumps in Japan. So we moved from these kind of uh, floppy phones to iPh new tech iPhones. Oh, and we really? moved from uh, paying with cash to mm. paying with the phone, you know, directly. So oh, nice. we skipped mm -hmm. the credit card uh, That's part so crazy. entirely. Yes, yes, that yes, is yes. so funny. Wow. Yeah, And I think it's not only Japan. If I recall, my friends in China told me it was kind of a little bit the same. So... Mm. I think it's an Asian Asian thing, maybe. I don't want to say thing I'm not sure about, but probably mm. it's, it's not only Japan. Yeah, I feel like I just recently started uh, using my smartwatch and my phone to pay, yeah. but like very recently. For the longest time, I don't know why in France we were all like, oh, I don't like this contactless thing because they could you know, steal all my money. Yeah. But, yes. But then it's like the pandemic happened and then everybody started doing it. So, yes. so it's really funny. Um, to be fair with French, this is true. There is more uh, thieves of with the, you know, there is, they have some apps or something and they can steal your money from your, uh, from your phone. Or I don't know how they do that, but it happens to my brother. And uh, mm. so he had to well, buy, you know, France, this kind of metallic uh, bullet. I don't know what it is. But, uh, there are a lot of thieves in France, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's, you're right. <laughs> that's so funny. But it's yeah. true though, like I yeah, was but... when I went back last summer. Yes. I, I was like I went to like a shop. I had to like buy some stuff for like whatever. It doesn't matter. I went to a shop. Okay. And the guy I was just like talking to the to a shop owner and he was just like, Yeah, like telling me all about his life. And he was like, Oh, well, if you're just visiting, 
make sure you get the metallic wallet and all these things. You see, like, you see, I told you they are crazy about the metallic wallet over there. I, I don't know yeah. why. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, that's crazy. I was like, who's gonna do? I was just like, yeah. I don't know. I didn't buy one, but no, I guess me neither. <laughs> metallic wallet conspiracy. Yeah. And so and so, how long did you end up working on uh, satellite? Um, satellite around so i worked for a few months then i went back to france for like i went back and forth to japan for like six months really and yes because i could not get my visa uh because okay this is something for you for you all uh teenagers who want to move to japan and uh you don't know if it's possible or not uh i never finished my uh, studies in france because um your college or your high school in my college because it it was a kind of uh, you know um art school about animation and illustration what was the Emile name Cole. of the school Emile oh emil cole yeah it's, so for everybody listening uh emil cole in france is a very very uh great school it's one of the best schools of, for like art in france but it's also very expensive and yes very difficult from a year to another there is like an elimination process yes, that is 25 percent pretty... of the students are eliminated yeah, I know. It's like a reality. They should make a reality show about this yeah, school. Yeah, that it's was like, not the best point. Yeah, when I heard... I lost so it, many good friends in this elimination process, so yeah. It's so bad. Yeah, like... Yeah. Not, I mean, it's just very stressful. Everybody who goes to that school, they're extremely stressed out. But you could think that it would make uh, students being like in competition with one another, but it's not the case, actually. Everyone is really like... Uh, oh, it's like trauma bonding. Nobody, yes, yeah, we have. Uh, yeah. Yes, everybody's like we're in this yes, together. Exactly. Yeah. That oh, was a good sweet. point. But it was, as you say, very expensive. I think at the time it was ab- around seven thousand euros a year. Which for France is very expensive. As yes. A school. For the mm-hmm. US, I know it's very different for you, but you have to understand that in France, this is the, one of the top expensive school for for art. Maybe one the the the, the most expensive one. Yeah. Well, also just like a side note, wages are very different in France. Yes, 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 um, yes, 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 yes. Like, like the like, just quick little financial note. Uh, I think the median salary in the U.S. is like fifty five k a year. And let me check. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. I never got that. (laughs) Yeah. Like. (laughs) Yeah. Like that's like the median. If you look up like any news outlet in in the U.S., fifty five thousand dollars a year is. Like the median, the average. Okay. Okay. Um, um, but I, I would say in France, it's like. I think a good salary in France would be like two thousand euros a month. Do that, yeah. So like, so that would be twenty four. Yeah, I think in France, like a good salary is half of the median salary. Yeah. In the U.S. We don't have to pay for uh, healthcare but, and uh, stuff like these. Uh, so. Yes, we don't have to pay for healthcare. Most of the schools, like community uh, yeah, college free, in France, yes. are like almost pretty much free yes, it's like 400 yes. euros to yeah, do exactly. like a year of community you college pay for, for the books you will use in uh, that mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so like, it's just to kind of like for everybody out there yes um, so it was very expensive and my parents didn't have this kind of money for four full years so yeah. um, after my third year i was not the the i have never been the perfect student to be mm. fair and how dare people... you not be the perfect yeah student? i know <laughs> okay. i know i'm sorry but yeah a few people at, at the top of the school were not very happy with me and my comport- the, the way i was acting in the school so were you a troublemaker i was not a troublemaker but uh i was very sarcastic and oh okay and if there th- th- there were some classes I didn't really like, I don't want to go in the details because maybe these people change and stuff. So, but I, I had my uh, I had different opinions mm, in life with the the wife of the uh, dean of the school, mm. and she was one the teacher of one uh, class I really didn't like. It's called pot. It's not pottery, but you know you have some kind of. Uh, mm. uh, you like have to clay. do some sculpture, clay, yeah, clay mm-hmm. stuff, clay model or stuff like. This. I was bad. I was super bad at clay modeling. It's you have no idea how bad I was, and <laughs> it, the school was hard. So I decided, you know what, my my notation, my uh, how to say, my grades in this particular class are super low. So if I if I don't attend to this class, I will have more time to 
work on other classes and anyway I just have one zero it's not a problem so I decided to skip this class entirely mm. but of course she was the wife of the dean so the dean came to me and say uh, if you don't come back to this class I will put you out of the school and it was at the wow. time when my dad my dad told me I don't have the money to pay for the last year so I decided to stop going to school yeah that makes yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah. But then, but then the problem that you had was like because you didn't have the paper, like the paper, then with yeah, Japan exactly. that was like a problem. Exactly, I didn't have mm. the diploma, and in Japan they want to see the diploma. Oh, if you don't have the God. diploma, you have to get ten years experience in this particular field you're working in. Wow! So at the time when I applied for the visa. And I guess if I had a lawyer, it would have been okay, but I didn't have a lawyer at the time. So I mm. did all the papers by myself because the company didn't know how to handle this kind of situation. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. alone with myself and my papers and uh, it didn't work. So I was, uh, I couldn't get the visa the first time. Ah, so I had to damn. go back to France a bit. I did, I assembled all the papers because <laughs> by the time I was in France, it has been 10 years I was working in illustration slash animation you know the government doesn't know the difference right so i could <laughs> assemble the enough papers and uh and falsify a few uh, signatures to get this uh, because you know i will not call my client from 10 years ago and say hey can you uh, sign this paper back so i did the sign for them and stuff and uh, i presented these such... papers yes i presented so the papers fresh. back we're like oh we can get <laughs> this yeah, yeah exactly. who cares wow. who cares and i'm sure they will not verify and they didn't <laughs> so I presented the papers back and I got my working visa. So it took like six months or so. So oh, I went wow. back to work in satellites for, uh, sorry, all this, all this point, just to say uh, I was back in satellites and I worked there for two or three more years. Mm. And Thomas, by the time, created his own company called uh, No Border. Mm -hmm. And after that, he asked me, do you want to join my company instead of working for satellite? Because I have never been the... You know, Satellite is a Japanese company and it's very hard to adapt to the Japanese way of working. You have to be of like at doing the office business. every time. Yes, mm. every minute of your life you must be in the company. Mm. And I, really, I really preferred the French way and so I joined uh, Thomas' company. That is so cool! And how long did you work at his company? I worked and... for one year and a half, I think, or two years. And I was not fired, but almost. <gasps> what happened? I had to leave because I had some, again, some di the divergence of opinion with the... So, you know, No Border was a... Uh, how to say? We had a mother company. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know if I can say that. I say it this way. A mother company called like uh, Ankama. Like yeah. Oh, parent company. Oh, it's... Parent it was with company. With the uh, Ankama? Okay. Yes, it was a parent company with Ankama and I had... Uh... For people listening, Ankama, yes. <laughs> they did, uh, <laughs> they're known for Dofus and Wafu. Because yes. I know there's like, a, there's a, there's a community of American audience for Wafu who really, really like the, the show. So it's just, it's like Ankama, like they're known for these. And so... Yes. Thomas' company, were they doing uh, Wakfu content? Uh, no, uh, no, no, we were, uh, that's the problem. We were oh, only okay. doing our business and sometimes we were helping Ankama and we were promoting kind of Ankama's uh, image by having this company and working with Japanese companies, you know. They could put mm -hmm. their logo in the, we did a lot, we, we, I did, we did some work for many animes, video games and stuff. So he, he could put the logo Ankama in a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But by the time I was only working for Japanese uh, companies, I was working with Shinichiro Watanabe. It's the mm -hmm. director of Cowboy Bebop and uh, wow, some rights and so cool. stuff. Yes, so I was working with wow, him. Wow, that is so cool. And, and you were like like speaking all like fluent Japanese by then, right? Maybe not ex hundred percent fluent, but yes, enough to work uh, with him. Yes, there were no that problem is, by the time. That is so cool. And I was working on the side on my uh, comic book Flavor Girls. Mm -hmm. published in the US with Boom Studios and uh, I'm, I have a super good relationship with my uh, publisher uh, at Boom she's called Daphna she's the best mm. and so I didn't want to change for another publisher but mm -hmm. because I was working for Ankama Ankama is also a publisher oh, they right. asked me if I could do f I mean Thomas asked me do you want to publish Flavor Girls with Ankama mm. And I was not super interested, but still, I proposed them the project. So I sent the, we sent the email and we proposed the project to them. And they, they said no, kind of. 
they they okay. never said yes so i said okay no problem i will do it with boom and it was okay it went uh, super smooth and it was okay but Ankama's big boss was very not very happy with that Really? He came back later when the book was published and said, I don't understand why Loic is not publishing Flavor Girls with us. It's kind of uh, not a treason, but. Uh, wow! But something like this. So mm -hmm. slowly he started to. He had uh, other problems with uh, No Border as well. I don't want to enter the details. It's their, their own uh, matters and their own. They have to. It's their story, not mine, so I will not uh, explain it uh, here, but. Basically, mm -hmm. they were getting my job for animation companies and starting to give me more job for Ankama, to do kind mm -hmm. of comic books for Ankama, like uh, webtoons, you know, um, wow, full that's great. online mm -hmm. stuff for Ankama. And I, they said, do you want to do this? Basically, it was my new job. So they said, they said, Louis, do you want to do this? But I had no choice to say yes. So. Oh, yeah. The, okay, I see. So they kind of put you in yes. a spot without your opinion, which is kind of, yeah, like, yeah. I could see the disagreement here. Yeah, but yeah. I said no. I didn't say yes. I said no. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. So I had to leave the company. So at that wow, time, I yeah. became a freelance and I started to work for... I lost my job over there. And because of disagreements, I was I made the full comic books for them with Thomas. And because of disagreements, they will never publish it now. So no I have way. a full... I have, yes, I have a full comic book for them that will never be published. And a full board game, 200... More than 200 no illustrations for this board game. Super funny board game that will never be released because uh, of some disagreements. Politics are so crazy. Yeah, it happens. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a good point to bring up because it does kind of go to show that as an artist, you kind of need to also be aware of all these kind of like that your part of your job is going to have to be like dealing with other people which sometimes we can like forget about when we're like so busy drawing you know what i mean yeah. like as a as a student so it's kind of good to hear that like even as a comic artist you can be like yeah. in in these kind of situations yeah of course of course it's that's... like basically you have your pilot and your tv show is cancelled by netflix at the last time and stuff it can yeah. happen also in comic books as long as your book is not printed and uh, that is so you don't have a copy crazy. it doesn't exist so yeah, yeah i feel like that's not really talked about a lot that's that's really uh interesting yeah do you so and and was was that would you say that's common or would you say that's kind of specific to the story? Like, was it, did that happen to you in other scenarios or just like this particular time? I don't want to be bitching, but I think it's a bit more common for Ankama than other companies. Okay, interesting. But uh, mm -hmm. it happens to a uh, few of my uh, friends as well, so... No way! I would say be careful, but it could happen in other companies as well, I guess. I don't know. I have no other example as well. Uh, other than yeah. Ankama, so I, I don't know. No, no, yeah, I just, you know, I just wanted to to check, but I feel like, because I don't know, I feel like in the US, and, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm not like a super pro of like what the US market is like, but it's like, quote unquote, so cheap to publish yes. a book that they're not taking a huge amount of risk. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes, yes. that's so interesting. So... And and so after you left with that the company where you so you were back to freelance and how would you describe your life as a freelance artist like how much of it oh no before we go to that I wanted to ask you were you drawing comics at the same time as you were doing backgrounds this whole time uh, yes yes on my that is uh, so uh, crazy how, at night <laughs> after my work at night I'm uh, drawing my comics yes. So I was going back home, eating, and uh, drawing my comics at night. Yes. How how would you kind of describe like your schedule? Like how many hours would you after like dinner would you spend on your comic? What's what does that look like a little bit? I'm usually waking up around nine because I can't really. I have sometimes to wake up earlier, but uh, nine is my uh, safe spot. So nine, I'm waking up. I'm rushing to the combini to get some food. Rushing to the, the office, and I arrive around 10 over there. Mm. And then you work until 7. If it's the French company, because it was a French, kind of French-Japanese company, so it's the French way, so you work until 7, so it's a normal day yeah. of work. Mm -hmm. If it's Japan, you stay around 11 p.m., but uh, it's not, so... 
Oh my god. Uh, Were you god. staying until 11 at satellite? No, because I was not a good uh, little uh, salary guy, so I was going home at 7 anyway. But uh, Vincent, yes, Vincent did overnight a lot and was staying around uh, 11 every day, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So at 7 I'm going home, eating, and then I'm starting to work around 9, listening to podcasts or having a movie on the side, and until mm -hmm. uh, 12, I'd say, until I'm too tired and I, and I have to... To go to bed wow that is such that is really long work hours because when you think about it, it's like it's like something like seven hours of drawing at the day job yes and yes. then it's an additional you said from nine to like like an additional three right on your personal project yeah, something like I'm, that yes but also you know how it is when you're uh, working in a company you have like you're not really physically drawing for seven hours there is one hour where you're just checking videos and uh, <laughs> as long as you finish your drawings at the end of the week you know they are not like you can lose some times here and there and uh, mm. it's not like you have to focus for seven hour, full hours I mean plus I was in an angle at the comp studio so nobody could see my screen so <laughs> I could chill a bit more than other people I guess nice and comic books also it's you know there is no like deadline and stuff. I mean, it's a super far deadline, so you can chill a bit and take the time. So I never yeah. feel the pressure of doing work, work, work for either the day job or the uh, the, the, the comic book job. But yeah. obviously, I was kind of frustrated because comic book is the thing I want to do, and I like doing animation and the, the, the salary was great, but mm. in the end, I'm not the biggest fan of anime. I don't watch anime, so it's... I could not say... Yeah, the only thing great is like, oh, I can say, oh, I worked with Shinichi Watanabe. And okay, one second, it said, oh, great, it's the guy who did Kobe Oh, it's great. And it's over, you know. There is nothing <laughs> I can show. There... I mean, it's great, but it's not my thing, you know, so... I wanted yeah. to stop that and draw my comics for longer. So doing freelance, being going back to freelance was actually a blessing because mm. I could use all my time for comic books and sometimes do freelance work for animation to get to get a better source in my pastas, you know. Ah, uh, so yeah, yeah, speak. like how we say in French, it's like yes. to put a little bit of butter in your spinach. In the <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> a little bit of butter in your spinach. Yes, we say. <laughs> yes. I'm not eating that much spinach, so I don't need the butter. But uh, yeah, you don't, you don't, yeah, you don't, you don't need to sweeten it. Um, that's so funny. I was gonna ask you. So it's you say like, oh, because the deadline is so far away for comics, I I don't need, I don't have a lot of pressure. But yeah. I guess for you to not feel the pressure, it must mean that you're very diligent with how much how you your schedule out your work on your book right uh how do you so can you tell us a little bit about what it's like for you between the moment you pitch your book until the moment that it's done like kind of like what is the life of a comic book artist <laughs> i will speak about the us because uh again daphna is the publisher i uh, like the most i mean i'm having a good mm -hmm. relationship with and Maybe the process is a bit different, and I guess many people who will listen to this, post this podcast will be more uh, familiar with comic books rather than bande dessinée. So mm. for the comic book industry, for my ex own experience, I'm not. I'm working on my own IPs, so mm -hmm. it's Persephone on Flavor, or Flavor Girls, it's my own stuff. So I don't have the pressure of doing some kind of, of uh, franchised licensed stuff like uh, Power Rangers or uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or stuff like this. So... Mm -hmm. I, I'm more free. I have no responsibility on my shoulders, so it's okay. Uh, they don't really care about me, kind of. Mm, so I see. Mm -hmm. As long as soon as I have my story and my characters and a few pages, for Flavor Girls, it was a bit different because I wanted to do the book mm. before I have a publisher because I wanted to promote it on the social medias before, so I did that. And at some point, uh, Daphna told me, hey, do you want to publish it with us, with Boom? And I said, yes. So we signed a contract and basically said, when the book is over, you can give it to me. Nobody is waiting for it. So there is, you have oh, no wow. deadline kind of. So I could nice. do, take the time I wanted to finish it. And we jammed together about what I should change because 
when you're a comic book artist, you have your own nose on the page every day, and it's difficult sometimes to see if everyone will understand this page uh, because yeah. you know it's implied in your head because you know your story, but maybe other it's not really easy to understand for other people. So mm -hmm. she's really good with rereading, uh, read, uh, how do we say, read proofing or something like this, and uh, yeah, proofreading it. Proofreading. And she had very, very interesting comments. So I, I made a few changes in the comic and mm. then they released it. And for the second one, it's a bit different because the first one has been released. So we decided that I should finish it by the end of 2024. So... Wow, it's yes. soon! <laughs> I haven't started yet. So yeah, I mean, uh, wow. I, I have 40 pages, but they are long done. So... So, but usually what I do is I know, okay, to this deadline, I should do 10 pages a month or 12 pages a month. And okay. so if I know that I've done 14 pages a month, I can take a little break the next month and draw, uh, do some side work, like mm. a few drawings for uh, backgrounds uh, for animation or stuff. If, if I'm late, I know I have to do more pages the next month. It's, uh, it's, mm. Oh, so you break it down by month. That's really yes. interesting. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. That's really cool. And so do you feel like because you break it down by month, like maybe you, there's a week you're not going to do any pages and maybe there's a week where you're going to do five or like, or is it just like... Mm, I try to... If I can, I will work every day on it to not be late and not be stressed with it. Mm -hmm. But if there is days where I cannot work, obviously it happens. I will do something else and it's not uh, a big deal. I will, I will work a bit more the next day. Mm. Especially when I take freelance work for animation, I tend to not take that much freelance work anymore now that, now that I'm living in Nagano because I don't really need it. Right. You know, I'm not this kind of person who will uh, want... I'm just getting enough money to pay the rent, pay... Uh, the food for the dog and a few magic cards and the video games uh, once a month, you know, so <laughs> I don't need that much of the money. So I could work more, mm -hmm. optimize my uh, work more, work more and get more money. But since I don't, I don't need it. I, uh, I usually just do my comic books uh, nowadays. And uh, so nice. I cannot, I can, I will not be late, I guess. Mm. I should not say that. You never know what could happen, but... Uh, if it continues this way, it's okay. I, I, I'm okay. I'm... Yeah. No, that makes sense. I think I no, that's really great. I like to hear about like the process and uh and how you kind of like schedule because I feel like comics are like such a big, it's such a big project that you're alone on most of the time, and so you need to be really really good about like time management, or else like you end up having to do like. A yes. crazy amount of work in very little time. I kind of like to ask you about the writing of your comics. How did you go about writing your stories? Like, are you the kind of writer that likes to have the full script, kind of like in every single little mm. detail before you start, or or do you change things that you go as you go? Like, what's your uh, first, I should say that I will answer this question, but I'm maybe not the most uh, legitimate person to say that because I'm not the best. Uh writer in the world <laughs> so mm -hmm. probably may, my process is maybe not the good one I don't know but for me I have the idea of what I want to say for example for Flavor Girls I have the main story for until the end of the book mm -hmm. and the books the series I know almost everything all what mm. that I, it's I, I wrote all the story all the the main uh, points, you know, uh, when they will fight this guy, when this will happen, this mm. uh, twist will happen and stuff. So I know all of this stuff, but I don't know the details. So I don't know what the pages, how it will be uh, cut in pages and stuff. So the details, I don't have them. And every time I start a new chapter, I'm writing the chapter and I'm saying, thinking, okay, I have this idea. I know we should go to this point to this point. Mm. point A to point B at the end of the chapter. Now let's make it fun to read, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes my chapter is, oh, they will, uh, this should happen between these two characters, they will fight this guy, but that's it. And I need to make every page interesting and fun to read. So I have to find new little details and uh, mm -hmm. maybe change some dialogues and maybe I didn't think about that or like, 
it, the scene was supposed to happen on this city, but it's the same environment all the time. So I decided to move this last scene in a gothic uh, castle or something. And uh, so I make all these kind of details afterwards. And also mm -hmm. Daphna then read everything. All the I kind of uh, do all the pages. So I'm doing rough drawings for all the pages. It's mm. difficult to read, but... I have the text on another uh, word, uh, word uh, document. Text, uh, document. So Daphna reads everything. Tell me, tell me. She tells me, okay, this is great. This could work better if we put this page before, or this dialogue mm. before, here and there. And when everything is done, I can start to do all the pages. And, uh... Oh, nice. Okay, so you you do, yeah, you you don't start drawing until you have everything. Yes, and approved. even after that, sometimes. I'm thinking, oh, this angle was not the best and I'm changing it. So even after the page is fully drawn, I'm still rethinking something and I'm changing some drawings. It happens mm -hmm. that I'm rereading at the end all the story when it's mm -hmm. all done. And I'm like, this this is not great. We need more details here or this page should not happen this way. And I'm rewriting some stuff at the end. So it's until the end, it's never really in uh, fully decided. So... That's I cool. could yes, I could release the next issue of Flavor Girls right now uh, with what I have right now, and I'm sure it will be. You could read it and still have new things to read when the real one will be released because I will change many things uh, again. So, oh wow, that's so interesting. But you know, it's a bit of a problem as well because when I reread the printed albums it's too late to change anything but i'm really like oh i should have done this this way and <laughs> so usually i put them in my uh, in my drawer and i don't look at them anymore because i'm frustrated when i check it i'm like oh this drawing is bad i should have done it this way or this thing should have happened like this and uh, so yeah oh yeah that is tricky that is so yes. funny that you yeah you you, you always want to improve your what you've already done i feel like i don't know i get like i get i i get that with the drawings but usually when i'm done like doing a page i'm like this is great i don't ever want to touch it ever again <laughs> yeah but it happens for a lot of pages but some i'm like uh i don't know but it happens to i i learned that it's also happened to a lot of uh, directors oh, i'm yeah? listening to a lot of podcasts and mostly podcasts about movies and i was surprised to learn that di directors also do that and they want to do director's cut long after the movie was released and they change some stuff and sometimes I, I don't know because it's I cannot really speak mm -hmm. for that but some critics prefer the first version than the the the, the, the director's uh, new version of the movie you know so I don't That's know I guess so interesting I guess I I'm the only one to think oh this is bad I should redo it maybe if I was re doing it some people would say wait the first version was uh, the best so what have you done <laughs> I, don't I don't know i think also people i think once you like see something for the first time you get very enamored with the way it is yes 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 i think because it's right. like the first time you ever discovered it and so i yeah. feel like when somebody goes after the fact and changes it then you're like well it's not the thing yes, that i read exactly exactly <laughs> yes, yes 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 true so that's so that's so interesting how do you i i noticed like all of your comics have mostly female protagonists. Do yeah. You... <laughs> <laughs> for Pocahontas, the, so for all of them, it's a different story. For Pocahontas, it's just that I wanted to tell a story about someone having to redefine its own life, his or her own. I mean, I don't know. Its own life, we can say. Its own life, maybe. Okay. It's... Uh, there? You can their use own it. life. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We, we don't have pronouns in uh, Japan, so I'm used to not using them, so I'm a bit confused That's every time. That's so interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you call someone, mm -hmm. you just say uh, the name, you know, like... Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. So their own life, we have to redefine their own lives, and I couldn't find a good way to, st to tell the story, how to start. And mm -hmm. I had a dream about Pocahontas, and I don't know where it was from. I was not the best fan of the anime, the Disney version. Been watching the Terence Malik uh, movie, uh, what's the name? The New World, I think it is. Mm -hmm. But it was long ago, so I don't know why it popped in my head. And in my head, it was clear. I needed to do this story with Pocahontas in my dream. 
So mm-hmm. I woke up and I was like, oh, Pocahontas. So I wrote Pocahontas somewhere on a, I scribbled it somewhere on a paper. And the next day I saw that and I was like, oh yeah, Pocahontas. So I read many stories, many books about Pocahontas and I decided that, yes, it was the, I could, I think that was also the point that people didn't like in this book. It's, I decided to not make a biography of Pocahontas. Mm-hmm. What happens to my Pocahontas in the book is not the, it, by all means, it's not what, what happens to Pocahontas, the the real, uh, the real character, woman. The, it's uh, yeah. a, a spirit vision. It's a, tot- my vision of what could happen to uh, this uh, um, Native American girl. And uh, so mm. it was the good angle for me. So she, Pocahontas is a female protagonist. So I didn't change that. So that's why I drew a girl for this. For mm-hmm. Persephone, I was, my inspiration were um, Ghibli movies. And in Ghibli mm-hmm. movies, it's usually girls, main protagonists in the mm-hmm. one I like. So for example, uh, Mimi Osumaseba, uh, I don't know the English, uh, the American titles. I think it's like Whisper of the Heart. If I'm yes, that's what correctly. it is. Mm-hmm. There is uh, Omohide Poro Poro. I love Omohide Poro Poro and I don't remember the name. I think it's like... Uh, memories. Uh... It's a Takahata movie with a mm-hmm. little girl, uh, ref- uh, uh, 25 year old, re- years old girl reflecting on her life. As when she was a girl in the Showa only era, yesterday. maybe only yesterday. Okay, only if yesterday. you have never seen Only Yesterday, it's a masterpiece of writing a character for me. And so Persephone, also Greek myth with a woman protagonist. So I didn't change that as well. So it was a female protagonist once again. And. Flavor Girls is the same. I loved the shoujo mangas like Sailor Moon and all that mm-hmm. and it's female protagonist. So I, it's like, it's almost like I didn't decide really on purpose to draw a female mm-hmm. protagonist. It's just the stories I like have female protagonist in it and by uh, mimetism, I'm, I, I'm doing the same. No, oh, that's really uh, cool to hear. But, I... you know, but you know, it's actually a real thing. I ask myself, am I... Um, legitimate to draw uh, female mm. uh, characters and female stories because I'm not uh, mm-hmm. a girl so maybe I'm having it all wrong you know so I and tend I to not think as them as girls like what would a girl think in this situation but just what would I think in this situation and why what mm. would this character because this character exists in my head I know what she likes what she doesn't like and I tend to think what she would do rather than uh, the gender she is, you know, so I don't know. Mm. No, I know what you mean. I feel like uh, I relate to that in a sense where, like, I think most of the stories that I come up with have uh, male protagonists. For some reason, it's something, because I grew up reading a lot of shonen manga, so for, yes, for, yes. for me, I like shonen more than I like yeah, shoujo you see, overall. You see? <laughs> yeah, so, but then I, sometimes I am a little bit, like, I'm like I do I do want like the themes to feel real for so sometimes I do feel like a little bit like oh I'm a little bit of an outsider in the sense I'm trying to write that story like a boy's story and I'm like and I have only my like I guess girl or like female bodied experience and like how people perceive me as Mm -hmm. which is very different in terms of like the kind of like existential thoughts I guess you can have uh, like existential like problematics that you encounter I guess as like a I don't know sometimes Mm -hmm. I think about that I I just kind of but then I'm I don't know maybe we overthink it too yeah I think so I think so I think there is limitation to these things I mean if my story was, okay, I want to to write a, a book about feminism and how it is to be living in a girl's body and uh, mm-hmm. being a woman, maybe I would feel not legitimate, you know, because mm-hmm. this is not me and I never experienced that. So I would not feel legitimate to write this story. But Flavor Girls, basically, this character, they the story and what happens to them is not really related to their gender. So we don't really care. Yeah. They're just uh, empowered characters who have to save the world in a way. So yeah, I mean, I felt okay with that. So. Mm. 
No, that's really cool. I like it's really interesting to hear kind of like the thought process and like that you you think about it too and that like you because because I, I think it's interesting to hear about like how an author thinks about their character and how they come up with the stories. So um hmm. I think that's really interesting. And I, I like how you described your vision of like Pocahontas. So like how you're like, okay, this is a story I'm gonna like focus on. Because it's yeah. it is true. Sometimes like it is kind of true that it like w the very first time that you come up with an idea, it just kind of sort of comes out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I like that you were t you were bringing it to the theme. You were like, okay, there is this kind of theme that I want to talk about, the, like about yes. like belonging, not belonging, and yes. and then but and then it's really hard to kind of bring that to a character and a story. I feel like I often get stuck in that space of like, oh, I'm really attracted to this theme. But now when I write it, it becomes very plot heavy and just like a mechanism to showcase that theme. And like, yeah. how do you kind of like work through that, I guess? I know, yeah. I mean, there is obviously better writers than I am and who could do that easier. It Easily, but I can't. So that's why I re I uh, relate. I mean, I relied on uh, mythology for Persephone, mm. kind of, and for Pocahontas, it was already uh, a character becoming a story already. So I cheated a bit because I mean, there is already a a story written, and I'm just rewriting it in my way. So for Flavor mm -hmm. Girls, it's almost the same. There is already a lot of shoujo mangas, and I can just I know I'm playing with how people perceive these things they know because it's in the pop culture right now and everybody, everybody knows about mm. and not everybody but a lot of people knows about Sailor Moon and this kind of stuff so and this genre so when I'm investing my time and in, in investing this genre I know people will know it already and I just have to rethink some new themes and stuff so mm. I'm not writing from scratch I don't know if I could do that if I'm a good writer enough to do that i, I prob i'm probably not so mm. well, it's okay it's okay because in comic book in the comic book industry you don't have to do everything you have uh, writers who can write the story and you just have to do drawings about it and stuff so it's uh, mm. well, I'm, really cool. I'm, I'm working right now on a series for a french publisher oh yeah but yes about it's a five books about yokai so the japanese uh, ghosts Mm -hmm. kind of they can be ghosts they can be anything basically demons or objects anything mm -hmm. and so i didn't felt that i could write the story about it so a writer is helping me i mean doing all the story and stuff i just have to to have fun drawing the characters that is so cool how um how did how do you so you said for flavor girl you were posting about them on social media and that's how your publisher reached out to you how how did you find that uh, partnership with your French publisher for the yokai books? So the writer uh, wrote me an email and said, I would mm. like to do a comic book review. So actually, no, I would like to start to do a project for an anim animation animated uh, series with you. Oh, for interesting. Kids. Mm -hmm. Yes. But at the time I didn't have, I could not invest myself in such a big, big, heavy project, you know, because you have to di direct direct the project from yeah. the top mm -hmm. and it's a full-time job and I didn't have a full-time I already had a, a full-time job so I could not do that so I said to him it's better if I start by drawing the characters and then if you want to make it an animated I mean, animated project with someone else you are free to do that so mm -hmm. I designed ev the the world and then he said, you know what, let's wait. And we waited and at some point he said, let's turn this into a comic book. Mm -hmm. And if we have time, we would, we would reach for French um, TV uh, networks and stuff to make it an animation project. So That's so smart. The, yeah, because, and yeah this, it's nicer to have the comic yeah. book first anyway. Oh, well, nice. Nice fan art. Okay, you can't see that, but uh, <laughs> we just draw a fan art of uh, V, actually. The name of this character is V as well, so... <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so yes, so he, he was already in touch with this French uh, publisher. So he just reached them and say, "Hey, we have this new project. Would you be interested in doing it?" And they say yes. So it, it was uh, easy. I had to do nothing. 
But usually uh, in but France, I don't know about the US, but in France, you just have to send an email to the publisher with your few pictures of your project and kind of uh, one page of explaining the story and stuff. And you can reach out to them and they will answer, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't say they will say yes, but they will at least say both or uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, it's great, but we already have something uh, similar or something like this. Or, or it would be great for this publisher. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, that's actually funny. I did that once. I was like, ah, I have. To, I, I was kind of publishing this like web comic, and I was like, I'll try to send that as a as a I don't know a thing to publisher, and they were really nice. They like replied. Like I was like, oh, I never expected them to like get back to me. Honestly, yeah, they were. It wasn't. They were like, ah, oh, it's not for us. But I, I okay. was like, oh, that's nice that they even like re- took the time to reply. If, if can I ask who was this uh, publisher? If it's uh, uh les humains, les humains d'associés. Ah, um, oh, wow, yeah, good one. I yeah. mean, I was just like, no, I'm no, no, gonna... but I mean, it's for, uh, for, of course you can uh, publish with the uh, humans d'associés. For people, I was just like, I'll just you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll see what they say. Yeah, of course, of honestly, course. I, mean... I was like, there's no way they're gonna reply to me because my thing was just like barely put together. I don't know. I was like, this is so crazy. Uh, for people listening, Les Humano is like, I don't know, they're kind of like, kind of, pre- almost kind of prestigious in a way. Yes, I think if for an older generation, it's the publisher who published most of the work of Enki Bilal, for example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's one of the big names that people could know, or I don't know, but they do a lot of different kind of books, especially recently. I like them I mean, because they do like uh, sci-fi. They do a lot of sci-fi yes, exactly. and weird worlds. Yes, so I was exactly. like, oh, they're pro- maybe, but then I, like now when I think back, I'm like, I'm so no, 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 no. I think it was nice. It was uh, great to do that. No, no, no. But yeah, like there, I, I wonder what people think of them now because I do feel like it is a little bit like an older generation type publisher. Hmm. Like my dad owns a lot of comic that was published by them. So that's why I'm a little partial to uh, to that kind of like, I would say they published a lot of, uh, didn't they publish the um, Peters and Squayton, like uh, they're the Belgian kind of like w- short stories that were ca- almost like Black Mirror, but like Art Deco. <laughs> it's possible. I'm not, uh, I can't censor this question. I don't know. Maybe. Yes. Oh. But they did a lot of really interesting stuff. So, yes. What would you say, this is like kind of like a left field, but uh, from this conversation, but like, what would you say are your biggest influences? Like, uh, like, for your art, writing, and like... You mean like, if it's purely drawing influences, I would say... So I I, I started this podcast by saying I was not uh, really uh, happy in France, and I didn't like France, mm-hmm. and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was complaining a lot, but actually uh, I was really, really influenced by the French uh, artists. So when I was young, I guess my favorite was Blutch. Mm. comic book artist Blutch I still think it's, his drawings are amazing I, there is no one who can draw like he's drawing it's uh, pure genius uh, if you don't know Blutch B-L-U-T-C-H you should google it and uh, it's amazing and so I try to draw like Blutch but uh, I, nobody can draw like Blutch except Blutch so mm-hmm. so besides Blutch I really liked I would say I really liked Miyazaki style as well mm. uh, it's a manga style so no mm-hmm. and stuff like this you know there is big uh, parts of black you know uh, ink drawing and uh, mm. but the characters are quite simple but still with a lot of details and I, I just really like this style so I try to emulate it a bit but again nobody except Miyazaki can do Miyazaki stuff so mm-hmm. it was a failure again and I'd say also Samura Hiroaki Samura the the manga artist of uh, Blade of the Immortal is that the title in the US we call it Ooh. Mugen no Junin in Japan I think it's Blade of the Infinite or Blade of the Immortal Immortals I'd say or the Immortal because he's, he's alone to be immortal I think that's what it is Blades of the Immortal Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. By Hiroaki Samura. Yes, Hiroaki yeah. Samura. Mm-hmm. Yes, and mm-hmm. this guy is. Uh, it's. I cannot reproduce the same kind of drawings, and it's difficult to describe. But I, 
I could spend hours looking at these drawings for uh, Blades of the Immortals or uh, other projects he's doing. I, I, in his illustration, it's I have to warn people who would like to watch, uh, who would Google uh, Hiroaki Samura. Uh, it's a bit graphic most mm. of the time in his illustration. Sometimes it's even too graphic for me, uh, and I'm like, oh, I don't mm. want this book in my house because it's, uh, I could not stand watching what he's drawing sometimes. But Blades mm. of the Immortal is less graphic, and you have nice drawings of girls in kimono and stuff like it's. It's incredible. The, the the way he's drawing hands and feet is mm. is unique. Uh, I think for me, it's maybe the best uh, illustrator in this entire world. As for oh, pure, really? For, as for pure drawing, I think there is no one who can uh, touch him. As a, it's pure grace. When I see some, there is drawings of just hands together, and I'm like, oh, this this is pure perfection. As Not an illustrator, even, uh... I feel the pleasure of the line, you know, the the perfection of the line. I feel like uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Inoue, uh, Takeiko Inoue. Oh, I love Inoue. Of yeah. course, I love Inoue. Yeah. He's a genius as well. Not only in uh, in uh, drawing, but in storytelling. He's, it's mm. incredible. And uh, I like also my friend. He's my friend. It's called, he's called uh, Mikkel Sommer. So Mikkel, oh, yeah, M-I-K-K-E-L-S-O-M-M-E-R. Mikkel yeah. Sommer is my favorite dude and I love his drawings and I love the guy as well. So um, yes, he has been a big, big inspiration for me. We talked, we started to be pen pals like 15 years ago and we exchanged a lot about drawing and storytelling and uh, he's still a big, big, big influence for me. So... That is so cool. Yeah. I'm always kind of like jealous of my guy friends who have pay pen pals because I'm like, wow, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> you I've can noticed... have a pen pal. You just reach someone over the internet and you send an email. And it's, it's, this is I'm just so really difficult. bad with emails. I'm really bad at writing a long piece of text. I feel ah, like I yes. sound like an absolute idiot if i write we all more do than three. and i think we do we it sounds like some total idiots but michael also sounded like a total idiot to me so it's just uh <laughs> total idiots speaking with each other about uh, idiots yeah but you're writing mostly. these like long kind of like fancy yes, yes, emails yes. which is so yes. nice I feel like actually nowadays we switch to you know in messenger now you have the option to record audio oh, so now we right. record long audios and sometimes it's a bit not annoying, but I see an audio coming from Mikkel in 28 minutes and you're like, geez, okay, I have to sit down, write, draw something and on the side put the 28 minutes long message and is mostly is so... saying nothing, you know, it's like, uh, hello Loic, because he's, he's Danish, so he has the, uh -huh. I, I should not mock his accent because mine is even worse, but uh, obviously, but it always starts like, hello Loic, and then he's speaking about nonsense stuff for like five minutes and uh, yeah it's, it's really funny before so he gets funny. to the point of speaking about drawings i guess oh my gosh that's so funny i love this you know yeah. it is something that i um and for people listening tell us in the comments how you interact with your friends because for me i remember growing up sometimes i would have like a guy friend who just randomly called me on the phone and I was like, why are you calling me? Really? I was this like, is weird. No. I was like, this is the weirdest <laughs> thing to me. Weird. Because for me, I'm like, if somebody calls me, it's like something important is happening. Yeah, of course. You of know? Course. And so like, I obviously I'm going to be like, hey, what's up? Are you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah. Just walking home from whatever. <laughs> and just, yeah, then she's just like, hey, what's up? And he just wants to have somebody to talk to. And it took me a lot, a lot, like a lot of years to understand like, oh, some people like doing that, just like, yeah. like interacting. Yeah, exactly. With the voice. And I was like, that is actually kind of sweet. Now I'm like, man, I should have picked up on that and just kind of kept calling. But I don't know. I'm more of like an instant message person. Yeah, so. I'm the same as you. I would have never thought about <laughs> calling back one time, you know, and uh, super weird. No, I mean, it's so weird, but it's so it's kind of nice. <laughs> now, as an yeah. adult, I'm like, that is that would be nice. Somebody yeah, calling true, true, me true, randomly true, true, true. to catch up, you know, but I feel like we kind of 
well, generations. Yeah. Don't we sound like millennials? That's I don't so know. funny. For me, it sounds like something that could happen in the 90s or in Seinfeld. You know, they always have the yeah. the answering machine and the jokes about the answering machine. And, you know, yeah, sure. But uh, I don't know. That's so funny. Yeah, I love that. Do you, uh, so because now that you're in Nagano, actually, this is like a really great subject to talk about. Like, do you have an artist community? out there like how do you kind of stay creative or like just or hang out with other like do you hang out with other creatives in real life do you have like are you kind of relying on on uh internet spaces more kind of what what is it like for you uh, as a creative like now that you're in a more remote city this is a good question so i have not been in nagano for long so a few months six months maybe Mm. But I already met uh, a French guy who is an artist in Nagano. Actually, he has an atelier. Really? Yes, he has an atelier with a Japanese uh, woman in um, not so far from my house. Actually, maybe ten minutes walk from my house. So there oh, is so artist nice. in Nagano. Yes, yes, yes. And, and actually, this uh, this Japanese girl, she is uh, doing a kind of let's say really indie. Uh, paintings and um, illustrations and she collaborated with some indie zines in France that I was uh, friends with when I was living in France like 15 years ago so it's wow really everything reconnects in a weird way that is so interesting yeah. wow so wait what was the name of the party. zine was it the, the name Chine? of the zine in France is called I don't know if it still exists it's called Hôpital Brut it's oh, wow. from a company, a company, a publisher called uh, Dernier Cri, Le Dernier Cri. It's from Marseille. Mm. And they are doing uh, mostly, let's say, really horrific stories, kind of really graphic stories, uh, but mm. uh, in, um, how do you call it? Rizzo print and uh, screen silk printing. So, wow. Uh, yes, the zines are really full of colors and. Uh, it's a bit expensive way of printing stuff, but you can have colors that you cannot have in normal uh, normal uh, publishing. So right. it's really different, really, really different <laughs> from uh, mainstream comic books and stuff like this. But that is it's so great. Cool. Yeah. And uh, so we do party sometimes, but true, it, I miss a bit this community, my friends uh, doing animation in, in Tokyo. So... Mm. I go back to Tokyo once or twice a month and to hang out with them and to do to play magic because I have also my magic community in Tokyo so That's right you you mentioned magic cards and I was yes. like do you play magic that yeah, is so Yeah we fun. play a lot of magic so would you ever want to design a magic card Wow oh, I wish <laughs> but uh, I've never received the call so <laughs> putting it out there anybody yeah. you know if if someone related to magic is listening to the, this podcast i would be very happy but most of my i have a lot of my friends are doing uh, magic cards actually so oh maybe yes, it will yes, happen yes, yes, one yes. day wow yes. that's so cool so i buy their cards because even if they are expensive i'm thinking i have to you know they are my friends and they design <laughs> magic cards so i have to buy it right so yeah, yeah, i end so up having expensive cards with their designs uh, because so, they're like but, rare they're like rare cards sometimes they do uh, kind of really common bullshit cards so it's okay to but, it's like yeah. 20 cents but sometimes it's super fancy edition and it's like maybe 10 bucks we'll say so i'm like oh come on oh it's not Think, so uh, yeah. bad the most I mean, expensive it, was like 20 yeah. bucks and i'm like yeah. okay this is it i will not go up uh, this, uh, this, uh, this yeah you're all not yeah this limit. i feel like yeah, I was yeah, I was thinking like there's no way it's more than like fifty dollars. I feel like some cards sometimes I feel like like if, if it's a new edition, there's no way it's like much more than that. No, right? yes, true. No. I think my most expensive cards are five thousand, like fifty bucks. Mm. But uh, I when I bought them they were like uh, <laughs> one dollar or so, but uh, you know they take if they are not reprinted, they, they they tend to get more valuable time when the time passes. But uh, yeah. Wow. Would you ever would you ever sell a card that one of your friends drew if it like if it was worth a thousand dollars? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
<laughs> Definitely. Yeah, there is no friendship anymore if, uh, if no the cadre comes. That's so no, funny. No, no. Oh my gosh. So So yeah, I miss them and thank God there is the internet because uh, you can well, play yeah. magic uh, through the internet and you can uh, have a uh, tea chat with artist friends through the internet. Without that, I think I could not have moved to Nagano, to be honest. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the internet. Honestly, I feel like having... I, I like to ask because I feel like having a creative community is like so helpful because I think it helps you stay motivated and it, you know, and I do think like you need to... I don't know. I feel like creatives were like such a like specific kind of like kind i guess <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's nice having somebody else that's kind of like on the same wavelength so you don't feel like you're complete like alien i guess yes also i don't know if it's the case for you as well but i'm super bad at knowing what is happening you know i mean uh, hey there is this exhibition this day or hey this happened in mm. uh, the animation industry recently i'm super bad with that i I'm never reading anything on Twitter or X, as we call it now, and stuff like this. So I'm always away from everything. So if I don't have this social interaction, I would be totally cut out of the world. I mean, mm. really, like, hey, there is this new TV show. Do you know about it? No. There is this new comic book. No, I don't know. <laughs> so if they are, if I don't have friends, I'm, yeah, I mean, I would still living in the 90s basically so yeah. honestly i'm a little bit of the same i i rely on a couple like on a discord community where like they share all of the articles from the trade and i'm not, i'm like oh so that's what's happening with Warner yes. brothers or like oh so that's what's happening those are the hot new shows but if it wasn't for that community because i don't really like i don't know i just want to follow other people's art i don't really yeah i mean I'm going to check Instagram to see drawings, but it doesn't explain to me what is happening, you know, I mean, in the industry, so... Exactly. I don't know. I, I did kind of start, like, subscribing to some news outlets on Instagram, but then I was like, oh, this is so... I don't know. This is not really why I want to come to Instagram. I what is a kind new, of wanna... new news outlet? Like kind of like <laughs> a, a news outlet, it. kind of like uh, like just the news from the world. Like, oh, this is like the new politic thing happening there, and this you is can new... do that on the, on Instagram. Yeah, like you can listen. You can like subscribe to the New York Times. Okay. Okay. Or... Oh, wow. I had no idea. Yeah, I think I. I think I sub yeah I follow the new I mean I followed the New York Times for a little bit and I, I think I follow another one I wonder if it's the Atlantic I follow the Atlantic okay. on a couple yeah. but now I realize all of my news sources are American and I don't follow anything yeah. French anymore do you keep <sighs> up with France <gasps> no not at all I, no I, mean, no, no. <laughs> I was not really following up with France when I was living there and it's yeah. even worse now I have no idea what is happening over there and. You know, sometimes I'm doing some. There is a little game on navigate on the internet called uh, Gartic Phone. If yes. you don't know, mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You do some little doodles and you have a sentence, so you have to redraw the sentence of some of your friends and stuff like this. And they are they are in France, and when they write what I should draw, I have no idea what they are speaking about. I think recently, I guess American, it will not speak with the American uh, audience as well, but listeners as well, but there is a astronaut in France that was kind of famous called Thomas Pesquet. And I think because he was French, it was a super big deal for them. And so I had one time to draw Thomas Pesquet, please draw Thomas Pesquet in space. And I was like, who, who the hell is Thomas Pesquet? You know, so I didn't draw anything. I drew an astronaut and they were like, what but you don't know Thomas Pesquet and uh, you know they they believe because I'm French I know everything about what is happening in France so, so funny. I don't know if it's the same for you but I don't even know who is the prime minister of France I, I have no idea what is happening over there so I know I feel really bad about it sometimes I'm like I okay and I don't know if you feel this way but like now this is just us being French so now you yeah. listeners just have to oh uh, maybe it will be cut suffer. yeah cut it if it's too fast <laughs> suffer through us being french but um i don't really speak that french that much anymore so yeah yeah because and that must be the same for you because you must be speaking english and japanese more than french yes, right yes 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 mm. i'm becoming super bad in french 
yeah exactly uh, yeah. i feel like it's like i'm like kind of slow i forget a lot of the words and i'm yeah, like oh same, i should same. just like it's it's kind of a weird thing to to have happen because it's like well i grew up in that country and that it's my mother tongue yes. and now i don't i'm not super fluent with it anymore yeah. and so i do follow french accounts like french comic accounts of like a couple of like of yeah. french artists that i really love so i'm like oh, okay so that that's those are like the new words the new <laughs> the new way of like formulating yeah. sentences but then i realized like maybe i should just kind of like listen to the news in french a little bit so it's i'm not just getting american news all the time <laughs> yeah but french news are really depressing i, I would never do that so i know I, uh... yeah i i guess you're right i mean i think i think american news are also kind of depressing but it, it's a different flavor of depressing <laughs> yeah yeah i think i, I as for a pe person who is uh living in another country mm. i i still think that uh even depressing things for other countries are a bit more exotic. So <laughs> it feels less depressing for me than my own birth country stuff. So yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean I do I do feel that. I do think it's true. I do think it's true that like for me when there's like some kind of weird political things happening here, I'm like, well uh, you know, it's yeah. you know it's <laughs> it's not exactly I mean, you know oh uh, that's so interesting yeah well but uh but uh, to be serious one second mm -hmm. because we're speaking about leaving our countries and uh, going somewhere else mm -hmm. for people who are a bit lost in their life like i could have been uh, when i was uh, younger in my uh, 20s mm -hmm. and you don't know what you want to do and you don't feel uh, you belong or uh, anything Mm. If you have the occasion to try the working holiday visa, I'm promoting it. I'm doing the promotion. They are not paying me for that, <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. you should try it. It will change your life a bit. Even if you don't stay in the country you visited, just going a few months, like six months somewhere else, it puts back in perspective your the way you think you live and mm. how you're stuck and you think you have no alternative in your life to do stuff. And it really puts your country away from yourself. Mm -hmm. And you can see your own life from, like, I always use this uh, analogy. It's like, if you're in the painting, like you're in the fighting painting somehow, and uh, going out for a few months in another country, it's really, you, you, you're out of the painting and you see the painting from afar and you're like, oh, okay, so this is the way I acted. This is what is happening. And I know now that there is alternate way mm. of living and thinking and for me it changed my life really honestly i mean uh, i could not see myself going back to france ever i mean i know that mm. if i change and if i don't spend my whole life in japan i will go somewhere else but definitely not france so it made me understand that about myself so yeah i mean yeah I think that's very true in a sense because I also kind of had that feeling after I lived for one year in Japan. There were some things that you know weren't exactly for me as yeah. you know as a woman, but but when I did go to, back to France, I had a little bit of a like a little bit of like oh is this it then kind of thing where like I still love to visit and to go to France, but there was a little bit of like I don't know yeah how to explain it where it's like oh like I don't know like luster it was kind of missing something I was kind of hoping to and I do feel like living in another country it's more challenging in a way because you don't have maybe all the elements of the culture but yes, I feel like yes. maybe in a way because you're learning a different culture and people know that you're an immigrant in a way it makes more sense that you don't exactly fit in maybe <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Also, I don't know about the US, but in Japan, I like the way to be, I'm a bit left alone. I don't know how to say, I mean, mm -hmm. because it's the way Japanese act, you know, and I guess for people, it could be something as uh, something bad, you know, a bad point of, about Japan, the, the feeling of not belonging with the Japanese society, mm -hmm. because you're not Japanese and a lot of stuff are not allowed for you because you're not Japanese. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and for me it's actually a good point because I'm a bit my pace you know I'm a bit 
on my own little spot and mm -hmm. I like to be away from the world. I guess that's also why it's uh, the therapy moment. Uh, I want. I needed to put 9,000 kilometers with my uh, birth country and be somewhere where I sh I'm alone, kind of, in my own, uh, my, my own stuff. So mm, yeah, For me, it's a good point. For some people, it could be uh, something they, they don't like, but... Uh, yeah. yeah. Everyone is different. Everyone finds its own happiness somewhere, so, yeah. But I love that, yeah, I love that you brought up traveling. I do believe traveling is a great way to kind of see different things, get a new perspective and just kind of, yeah, also help gets you out of a funk. I wanted to ask you to kind of wrap up by asking you about if you ever experienced creative block and when you do, what does it feel like and what do you do to get over it? <laughs> it doesn't happen with the stories. I always have many, 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 many stories I want to tell at a time, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Even now I'm, I have two different series of comic books to draw and still I want to do something new. <laughs> but for drawing, it happens that I can't draw. You know, I think it happens to every illustrator mm -hmm. and I think they all, way, all said the same thing in the podcast. There is some days you take your pen and it doesn't happen. I mean, it doesn't work. You don't know why it's not the day for. Uh, there is nothing to do about that. So... There is nothing to do except not drawing this day. And mm -hmm. if you're a freelance, you have the chance to just do uh, play video games, go out and have a drink with your friends. And the next day will always be better. Or sometimes you also need to draw and do a bad drawing until it becomes okay. I don't know. Sometimes I'm really pissed, you know, and my drawings are really bad. And I, I'm like, gosh, how is it possible? I can't draw. I can't draw anymore. So usually I'm going to complain, I'm going on my bed and I'm like crying, <laughs> sobbing a bit, you know, like oh, I'm no. a loser and everything I do is useless anyway, any way, and no one will read the comic book anyway, it's like 1000 people will buy it, who cares, I will be dead in 20 years, so this kind of stuff. And so I'm listening to a lot of podcasts, I'm trying to change my mind and... Uh -huh. There is a good podcast when you're in this uh, in this state of mind. It's actually a podcast in uh, uh, English, so you can listen to it. I, I guess everyone knows already, but it's called Radio Lab. Oh, nice! And it yes, it helps put you back on this. It pins you back in the planet, thinking, yes, you are nothing, and yes, it's useless, mm -hmm. but it will help other people to maybe feel good about themselves or uh, I don't know, they always cheer me up. And uh, so, yes, this is my uh, my way. I mean, I, this podcast has been recommended to me by a dear friend called Ulysse, Ulysse Malassagne. I don't know if oh, you know Oh, yes, Ulysse. I know him. He was on the... I need to get him on the pod eventually. Yes, he he's he great. graduated um, one year before me from Goblin. Oh, okay, 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 yeah. Yeah. Great, great guy, and he said, "Hey, I'm sure you will love Radio Lab. You should listen to it." And uh, he was right. So, yeah. shout out, Creative Block. Listen to podcast, watch a movie, something that makes you, yeah, that cheer you up, and that's it. Yeah, I love it. This is so great. Is there anything that you want to plug before we go? Like maybe your social media, or like your new book, or I don't think there is nothing that you want to advertise. Well, we'll take care of that for you. Yes. By putting all the links in yeah, the description can, of the yeah. episode. I mean, yeah, you can go your... and uh, yeah. <laughs> watch stuff if you want. <laughs> Feel nothing better to do. No, you should check out Luik's work. Um, Luik's artwork is absolutely amazing. His comics are so full of life and with like very, very uh, great designs. <laughs> So um, with that, that is the end of this creative walk. Loic, thanks for being our guest and sharing your story. Thanks for and having me. Of course. Uh, thanks for making the time. And thanks to our listeners. Follow us on social media. It's at CRTV Block, where you ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests when we remember and when we don't have like schedule hiccups. Huge thanks to our editor Clemens for editing the podcast, Marco for helping us produce the show, and Ibuka for creating the short clips we've been putting out. If you love our show, you can support us on Patreon. It will get you early access to interviews and access to our Discord community. Another great way you can support the podcast is by interacting with our content. You can please subscribe, 
please uh, like and share and comment. If you don't know what to comment on this episode, you can tell us, have you ever traveled in a, in a foreign country? Tell us that. And so uh, click the link in the description of this episode to see all of Loic's amazing artwork and to check our Patreon. I have been your host, V, and we'll see you next week. Bye.